to get your maximum diversity of gut microbes, which is gives you the greatest health for your immune system and your brain and all the chemicals they can produce, you should be having around 30 species of plant a week. And so as long as you stick to that, that can be back to basics, but keep it diverse. Do not get, uh, you know, diverted down some narrow tunnel of propaganda or religious fanaticism about a particular range of foods or this is super this or super that or I'm only going for these B vitamins or I'm only doing this. This reductionist nonsense is the new technology is making mockery of that. You know, we're, we're incredibly complicated uh, chemical factories. Our, our microbes are chemical factories. You know, we've got 26, we've got 20,000 genes, 26,000 different chemicals in food. We, we're producing, you know, we have thousands of species producing. We'd have you know, thousands of genes. And it, all of these are interacting. And so all our knowledge so far has been so reductionist, picking one vitamin, one nutrient, one of this. And everyone thinks they're an expert because, oh, do you realize that, you know, how much phosphate is, it, is in a <laughs> carrot? And, you know. <laughs> And people often catching me out because I've got no clue about, you know, because I, I, I've got no interest in that because I'm interested in the fact that, you know, a carrot has 600 different chemicals. Yeah. And I, we don't know yet. Half of it. Even half probably it. more than half of it. We do yeah. know that if we just took one of them and put it into a vitamin, uh, made that in a factory in China and said, this is, you know, carrot vitamin, uh, I could make a lot of money on it. But it wouldn't be the same as eating carrots. Yeah. No, I, I really do like so much of the approach, Tim. And it's, it's, it's what it's, I've got to be honest, it's, you talk about in food, it's one of my frustrations in medicine, actually, that I think we have become super, super reductionist in how we look at things, even to the point of this is a gut problem, this is a chest problem, this is a heart problem. And I get it, right? And I understand that there is merit in that. But actually, you sort of said something at the start of the conversation that, a lot of your colleagues actually are, are stuck studying one area and you have almost this kind of super generalist approach where I've, one thing I've noticed is that you, you, you've you pivoted quite a few times in your career with that sort of underlying theme of what you stand for. You know, you started with the twins and genetics, but you've you managed to pivot and apply those principles to lots of different areas, which I find really, really fascinating. Uh, you mentioned him the carnivore diet there. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes on it because it is something that is taking off hugely. Where, where do you come down on it in the sense that, let's say an individual patient, let's say it was one of your patients who was struggling with pain and all kinds of symptoms, and they you know, found someone on Twitter who was advocating it, and they then go away and start doing it, and a lot of their pain and symptoms go away, which is seemingly what is happening. What would you say to them, based upon the research you've done, what you're seeing in your trials, what you know about the gut microbiome? Because for that individual, they're experiencing a benefit. So what should they do with that in view of what the research shows? Well, I think that should... Um, it's a tricky the, question, I know. It is, but it's a good question because, I mean, I, I have it as well. And a lot of people do come to me and say, listen, you know, I read your book, but I, I put, you know, I do very well on this. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so shut up, you know. <laughs> um, uh, and I can't argue with that because, you know, th they know best what they feel like. Uh, all I say is that any diet that restricts you, um, I think is likely to cause long-term problems. So by people who've gone, you know, whether it's uh, high fat or uh, high meat, uh, means they are excluding other stuff. And some of that stuff they might have got rid of might have been very bad for them, you know, lots of starchy carbs and things like this that didn't agree with them. All I would say is uh, long term, if you deprive your, your gut of fiber, all the studies show, and, you know, one of the experiments was on my son who uh, took McDonald's only for 10 days and took three years to recover. Um, 
You're, you're a proper scientist. Do you know what I mean? If you can't, can't get the funding, just put your son on, exactly. on the McDonald's diet. Everyone should use their children. I think that's, that's, the, that's the message here. Um, but no, so by all means, carry on doing what makes you feel good, but try and introduce some plants yeah. that aren't likely to mess up your blood sugar, that keep the, you know, if it is this 70% fat, that you know, the keto diet thing, I, I, you know, I absolutely do believe it works for some people. But I do think there has to be that short-term balance of uh, improving those symptoms with a long-term one to say, well, you don't want to be messing up your gut microbes so you've got no immunity later on. Yeah. You know, once you've got you over your pain and your initial problem, you need to be uh, – and it, these can be just by eating lots of seeds. It can be eating a lot of herbs. You know, it can be eating nuts. You know, it doesn't have to be restrictive. So if people just keep in this mind that – Okay, I can do these things, but I must try and maintain diversity. Yeah. You know, what other ways can I feed my gut microbes? Then I'm very happy for people to do their own thing, yeah. and I, you know, I embrace it because I think, you know, a lot of these things are trial and error. Yeah. But don't don't let, be dominated by someone else telling you what worked for them because they had their special book yeah. and they cured it that way. You know, everyone's got to just look at the science and say, okay, th I'll try this, but. Under, underlying it, I know long term, I need to look after all the organs in my body. And your microbiome is one of the most important organs in your body. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really sensible approach, one that, that I very much agree with. And, and, and I sort of, I feel also that it's not just food, actually. So let's say someone is crippled with pain and in symptoms, and that's how they go carnivore, and that pain gets uh, dramatically better. Well, also, there's a knock-on effect in terms of how they feel about themselves, their life, their stress levels. I've seen over and over again that persistently high stress levels can absolutely impact um, the way people feel after certain foods. You know, I've, I've I've seen patients who actually thought they were intolerant to a food, and actually, what it appeared is that they were intolerant to actually eating in a stressed-out state, like not switching off, and. I, I'd be interested as your research uh, continues whether there'll be any work done on actually, you know, stress levels whilst eating, how that impacts blood sugar response, how that impacts inflammation. Because I would, I would imagine it will have a response, but I don't have the data uh, to show. So, so do let me know if you if you study that at some point. Well, yes, it's adding the stressometer to the uh, to the recordings, but uh, we, you know, in a way, I think we are asking people about. Um, uh, general contentment, how they're feeling at the time, and they're as they're logging on their foods. Yeah, and so we do get an idea of uh, their well-being at various times in the day. So, uh, as well as sleep and exercise and uh, fatigue and these levels, they're all interrelated. So I think we are going to start asking uh, quantitative things about stress and, and see how that fits in. So I think. But you do need big numbers to do that, and that's. Yeah. But we're now up to about we've done about three, four thousand people now, uh, in great detail, and hopefully with this commercial stage, we should be able to get to ten, hundred thousand people fairly quickly, and then we can answer these yeah. more subtle questions. Wow. You know? uh, and you know, yeah, and so there's really no limit um, if you can keep getting enough people to do these tests yeah. to work out what's really going on and we're, realize how complex we all are. Yeah. Tim, look, I could go on for hours. There's so much I want to talk to you about that we've not done yet. Um, but I think we should close off this conversation. I think it's been a very different one to our first one, back on episode one, yeah. uh, you know, all, all the way back. Uh, I would love to encourage people to pick up your book, Spoon Fed, Why Almost Everything We've Been Told About Food Is Wrong. I think for anyone who's got even the remotest interest in this area, I think they'll find it super enjoyable to read, but also illuminating. Um, to sort of finish this off, Tim, I don't know if I used to ask this on episode one or not. I'll have to go back. I'm not sure I could bear to listen to myself on episode one. But one thing I tend to ask people at the end is I say, well, this podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our life. And in view of everything you've done with personalized nutrition in this book, but also in uh, the diet myth before that, I'd love you to think about some really practical tips that people can think about now at the end of our conversation. They can think about applying them into their own life immediately 
to start improving the way that they feel? First thing is to realize that everyone's unique. Okay, so once you realize that, um, you can explain a lot of the way you, you interact with health and food and exercise and your environment. And you should be free to, to self-experiment. And I want everyone to get out there and realize the amazing amounts of good, interesting foods are out there and that I don't want people to read this book and get worried about uh, themselves and uh, the food environment and chemicals and whatever. It's really important that people remain fascinated about food and enjoy it because it's, it's incredibly powerful bonding human experience eating so i want people to experiment try some new dishes you've never tried before um, try going for a week without meat or if you uh, try uh, only eating vegetables or try skipping breakfast try doing things in a different way so exercising uh, after you've had your meal rather than before it um, try mixing everything up really and uh, the important thing to realize is that if you can um, start to think of everything you put into your body is important, um, not just for the pleasure it gives you immediately, your metabolic responses, but also uh, you're feeding your aquarium, if you like, or your, your tank of gut microbes, uh, and they can produce chemicals to make you feel happy and relaxed and try and find that, that right balance. And it can take all of your life to find that, but uh, if you can do it in a way that's fun and enjoyable, then uh, that's, that's the most important thing. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. Blood pressure comes down, joints seem to get better, bowel symptoms seem to get better. This is going to keep your eyesight. This is going to keep you from getting dementia, renal disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cancers. You are not your habits. You can do it.